Welcome to the THW What's Kraken show hosted by me, Tom Pepper, Sean Raggio, and Adam Kersenblatt. Presented by the Hockey Writers, we talk Seattle Kraken hockey every week on iHeartRadio, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to check out our written work at thehockeywriters.com and follow us on Twitter at, at Tom Pepper, at Raggio9124, and at Adam K. Blatt. So, We've got Adam back this week. He, we had uh, Matthew filling in last week to talk some Canucks crack and rivalry stuff. Uh, so it's great to have all three of us back. So how are you guys doing? How was your uh, how was your week off, Adam? Well, I didn't really. Unfortunately, it wasn't a week off. It was uh, travel. But you know, as you can see from behind me, I know the I know the Vancouver Seattle rivalry pretty well, even going back to the WHL. So. But I watched the show. You guys did great. Uh, I'm excited to see what this rivalry holds because just knowing based off of the WHL rivalry that we've had for years and the rivalry that Vancouver's had with Portland, it's sure to uh, get pretty spicy up in the uh, Pacific Northwest this year. It should be exciting. Have you been, Sean? How was your week? Well, I can't say I've been pretty spicy, but it's been a pretty all right week. (laughs) Yeah, uh, just working, doing some writing, and uh, got to see some family. Moved my siblings into college this past weekend. They go to my alma mater, Quinnipiac University, and I got to catch my little cousin's uh, hockey game. They won. It was a good game. My cousin Solana had two goals. My cousin Annalisa played well, so future's bright for women's hockey. I'm excited to see how far they go. Good stuff. Well, I'm still up at the at the cottage hanging out when played some golf today, so – uh, I should be back in my my regular show set up soon. So how'd you play? Pardon? How'd you play? How'd I play? I'm actually I'm actually just getting into it. I think that's my fifth game now ever of golf. So and I'm loving it. So <laughs> it's going well. All right. Let's uh let's get into it then. So there's not obviously a ton of stuff of, as we've seen the last few weeks. Uh the Kraken really haven't made a ton of exciting moves. And I don't know if this is what we really expected. I mean, there was a lot of talk about would they move players after this expansion draft? Would there be a bunch of trades? And I think what the biggest move they've really done is trading Tyler Pitlick. So there, there hasn't been, there hasn't been that much excitement, but they did add again to their defensive depth this week. So uh, on Wednesday, defenseman Gustav Olafsson signed a one-year two-way contract worth 750 k at the NHL level. Again, we're very used to hearing this now, the one-year contract. Uh, seems like Ron Francis is strictly just sticking to one-year deals at this point. Uh, so, he's, so he's Swedish, 26 years old. He was drafted in the second round by the Minnesota Wild in 2013, 46th overall. Um, and he's pretty much mainly played his career in, in the AHL. He's played 203 uh, AHL games between the Iowa Wild and the Laval Rocket. 71 points, 11 goals, 60 assists. Um, so this is this is a guy who's probably, again, going to end up playing in the AHL and maybe in the future working his way onto a roster spot. But, I mean, I don't, I don't see him in that position right now. But what are your, your guys' thoughts on this? Adding another guy to the, the – the, Sorry, <laughs> the defensive depth for the crack in here. I'll go to you, Sean. I think that they probably could have used a bit more help up front. I mean, especially if he's going to be playing in the AHL, which I think is a safe bet. Consider, or despite Ron Francis's quote uh, about him being a smart two defenseman and how he's happy to be joining their blue line, I think that's more geared towards the AHL. They got a lot of names ahead of them. There's going to be more from us as a collective coming out on this in September on their defensive core, but off the bat, they got Giordano, Alexiak, Larson, and Dunn. And I think that's pretty fair to say they're penciled into the top four. At least that's my top four. Spoiler, beware. (laughs) But there's definitely room for some movement in that bottom pair, seventh defenseman. Injury bug, anything could happen, knock on wood. But he could get some games. I think that definitely it's going to be that AHL type type, uh, season for him. And again, kind of, I get the depth, especially if you're kind of knowing he's going to be there, but they could use another center, I think, a little bit deeper. I mean, there's good versatility on their forward group with guys who can play wing in the center, but someone who's a center, I think, wouldn't be the worst. 
idea. I mean, it's good to have versatility, but you lose reps with guys who end up switching off and playing the wing. Yeah. Adam, what do you think about the uh, Olafson signing? Well, I think it's any time you can bring in defensemen that have experience in the in the pro league, it's always a positive. You know, I'll go back to the Vancouver Canucks. Back in 2011, they lost defenseman after defenseman after defenseman, and it was a uh, college player, Chris Tanev, that had to step up in, in the Stanley Cup Finals. So you never really can have too many defensemen, I feel like, that can actually play the position. There are too many defensemen out there that you that you really can't trust. Uh, Olofsson seems like the type of guy that if he gets put into five games, ten games a year, there's going to be no, there's not going to be many problems. You know, you can stick him on your third pairing, and uh, it's always good to uh, give these college guys who have been in the AHL a chance because who knows, maybe they'll uh, surprise, and that way you can your defenseman is your best asset. So if he surprises and he makes the team then the, they can go out and trade uh, one of their maybe top four defensemen out or another defenseman out to uh, a team that's struggling on the back end with injuries or whatever to acquire that center or that second line winger or, or that depth peat the, that they will need uh, in the future. He is mm-hmm. a, a former second round pick. So someone saw something they liked. And I mean, yeah, it was 26. It was the 2013 draft, but that's still not too far removed. A lot of, I, I don't, I'm not looked uh, right up on when he made the jump to pro from college, but a lot of college guys are not coming into the NHL, you know, until they're in early twenties, 21, 22, some of them. So he might not be as old of a pro, you know, if, if that makes sense. In his pro yeah. career, despite the age looking like he's been around for a while. If I remember correctly, I believe he he made his NHL debut when he was twenty with the with the Wild. So he's twenty six now. Um, <laughs> but you know, defensemen take longer to develop. You know, maybe there maybe there's a chance he could turn into something. But thanks for trying. Uh, to again, it's just a really just another defensive depth signing, and we'll kind of expand on this a bit more. I know, Sean, you just you were just mentioning about uh, how you think maybe the Kraken should be focusing on building more forward depth rather than how, how much focus we've seen on just signing defensive depth guys over the last few weeks. What are, what are your opinions on, on the defensive depth for the Kraken right now? Do you think they should keep pursuing this? Should they get a few more guys or you think this is, this is good now? I'll go to you, Sean, first. I think they should kind of go for guys who they know are going to be AHLers and more, an emergency call up type thing. Uh, it'll keep the cap down two way contracts are not at all a bad thing. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier and it was a good point by Adam with the Chris Tanev point there. Injuries happen, God forbid, but it's never bad to have too much depth. But at the same time, you don't want a log jam of guys who can play at the NHL level and then getting buried in the AHL. These bubble guys, I think are the guys you look for because if you're signing guys who are, you know, even if they're bottom pair NHL players on other teams, you're going to make, and they're being buried. Who's going to want to sign there if they think there's a chance of them getting buried, you know, guys want to play. They want to go where they're going to play. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Adam? Well, for me, I already have my top six pretty much solidified. And that's even discounting players like Jeremy Lazon and Dennis Shalowski, not even making the team. And those are some pretty good players. Like I'll take Dennis Shalowski on my team any day of the week in my top six, but they have a strong depth, uh, defensive core, but it's not a big name defensive core. Really. It's not like that defensive core. That's going to be in the top 10 of defensive scoring. It's one of those defensive cores. That's going to be one of the most solid in the league. They're going to be very difficult to play with. So I think that their defense is uh, pretty solid right now. And I don't really see Olofsson getting in there unless you got maybe six or seven injuries. But it's like I said, it's always good to have defensemen lying around. I don't think they really need to add anybody to their actual roster, but also they have to start building up their AHL roster. It's kind of the same situation uh, that Vegas had a couple of years ago where you're a new team, you have zero players. So you need to start making these signings so that you have an AHL team. I know they're going to be sharing this year, but it's always good to have those players 
in the bank just in case. Yep, for sure. And just going back to Olofsson before we swap over topics, he he's also, he was the alternate captain uh, with the Laval Rocket last year. So maybe Ron Francis saw a little bit in that, thought he could bring some leadership skills to the franchise as well. Um, so overall, just another solid depth signing, in my opinion. Um, and now we, we can move on to our next discussion of the day. So this is a, a pretty interesting one. So Seattle Thunderbirds, WHL team, Western Hockey League, goaltender Thomas Millich was invited to an amateur tryout to attend the NHL and rookie camps with the Kraken. Uh, so he's 18 years old. He went undrafted this year. Um, and he was ranked 10th uh, among North American goalies by NHL Central Scouting. So this is a, a pretty interesting storyline here, seeing uh, a major junior goalie who actually stars in Seattle already now getting a chance to maybe prove himself with the new NHL team there. So I'm going to go to Adam first on this one, our, our WHL specialist. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think this is uh, the right move? Are you excited for this? Do you think he maybe has a shot at earning a, uh, a contract with the team? So I don't, I don't, think that he's going to be signed by the team this year because he'll go back into the draft and he'll get he'll try to get drafted again a lot of the time you see these goalies in their eight, uh, 18 year old season sign these uh, PTOs because in the WHL it's very hard to be a starter when you're 18 years old uh, it's just that's kind of how it works um, but as for Millage. You know what? He's an excellent goaltender. The information that I've got on him says that he is going to be a uh, star in this in the WHL. Maybe not this year, but next uh, the year afterwards, because I know there's kind of a crease battle in uh, Seattle going on right now. And we'll see, you know, how the season really plays out. But you know what? I'm, I, I always advocate to sign the BC boys, so I love it. It's a great option because now Seattle's bringing in those faces that people know they've already brought in Alex true, who has the background with the, uh, with the Seattle market because he played for the Seattle Thunderbirds. So anytime that you can bring in that player that has that background and understands what it's like to play in, in the Seattle area and fans have a connection with, because they've watched him, it's uh it's never a bad idea. Yeah. And, and you mentioned he's he's on the path to potentially being a, a star in the WHL this past season. He was the, the U.S. Division's Rookie of the Year. So uh, he clearly has a bright future in that league and potentially in the NHL someday. So, Sean, I'll get your thoughts. What, what are your thoughts on this? I think it's a real good way to connect the Kraken to the Thunderbirds. I mean, at the very least, that you know, he only had nine games this past season, so that might have been part of the contribution to his not getting drafted. There was just such a small sample size. So you get him on this amateur tryout. Now he's getting reps against the big boys, right? So that can only help him going back then into a Seattle Thunderbird season against guys still, you know, younger than he was playing with now, more or less, right? Getting those reps up, I think, will could potentially help his confidence off the bat. And as you said, Adam, there's a goalie battle there. That could give him an edge going into the season. I think that it's, I mean, in the unlikely event that they sign him, because as you said, with the, um, a lot of them will go back into the draft. I think it's just a good, as you said, to connect with the fans and almost now I talked a bit last week about, you know, homegrown, at least with leadership group for me, the more home homegrown guys you get, I think the better. It, it builds a chemistry, it builds an atmosphere. And that's how you really connect with your fan base, especially when you got, a farm team, you could say a farm team, if they're right in your backyard of the Seattle Thunderbirds right there. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, throw, out a, I'll throw out one more thing about the uh, Seattle, <coughs> sorry, the Seattle Thunderbirds that uh, is important to note, and that is that the Seattle Thunderbirds seem to be in this rebuilding mode. I, uh, I just based off of what I've heard, they've traded away Cade McNeil, they've traded away Paint Mount, they traded away Luke Bateman and Kai Uchuk. Now Kai Uchuk was uh, for per, uh, there was there was a backstory to that. That's more of uh, they needed to get him out of Seattle because um, of some uh, 
bullying of of uh, biopoc teammates uh, back earlier. So that one, I understand. The other ones signal to me that they're kind of in that rebuild because Portland is still going to be excellent next year. The division is very is going to be very tight. So when we look at his numbers next year, his numbers might go down a little bit, but he's still going to have a great season just because the team in front of him is not going to be at the at the level that they have been in the past. Yeah. Yes. It's important to contextualize that then when looking at him ahead of the next draft, assuming he's not going to sign, although he'll probably be there either way. And I just wanted to clarify, I said farm team earlier, which was the wrong term. I think I was meaning to imply more of a pipeline, a pipeline to the Kraken because a farm team would be like a AHL, ECHL team. So just want to clarify that. And uh, yeah, we can. Uh, what's next, Tom? Huh? What do you got? What do yeah, you got well, I mean, it's it's going to be exciting here too. I think uh, the Thunderbirds are probably also going to get a lot more attention now, just because there's an NHL team in the city, and you got the new Climate Pledge Arena, you got the Crack and Ice Plex set up now. So it looks like hockey's really about to take off in this city. So it's exciting for for both teams and Thomas Milich getting this this uh, amateur tryout from the Kraken is again just promoting more. Uh, attention towards Seattle hockey at the major junior and the professional level. So it's going to be exciting to see how this all, all works out here. So we'll reset the show. And then uh, we have a, a couple other interesting topics to kind of get through here. There's obviously a bit of a s- slow news week, um, but we're, we're going to try to keep this interesting here. So you're listening to the THW What's Cracking show hosted by me, Tom Pepper, Sean Raggio, and Adam Kersenblatt, presented by the Hockey Writers. We talk Seattle crack and hockey every week on iHeartRadio, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Make sure to check out our written work at thehockeywriters.com and follow us on Twitter at, at Tom Pepper, at Raggio9124, and at Adam K. Blatt. So the offseason, I don't know if this is if it's gone as uh, as a lot of us expected. Me personally, I was expecting a bit more uh movement maybe some more trades but to be honest i'm i'm satisfied with how the roster is looking now uh but it certainly has been a bit more quiet uh than i was expecting and now we're, we're less than a month away from preseason which kicks off september 26th against the vancouver canucks so that's that's going to be an exciting one to watch but we'll, we'll start with this question so we're, we're just going to kind of predict what what the remainder of the Seattle Kraken offseason is going to look like? Is anything else going to happen, or are we pretty much just set to go here? So, do you guys think uh, Ron Francis could make any more trades uh, within the next month or so? I'll go to you, Adam. I think it's very possible that he makes a trade for a defenseman. Um, I I would have no idea who it would be, but you know maybe a guy like uh, Carson Soucy uh, might be one of those players that's uh, attractive and can bring in a forward but you know I'm I'm sitting here and I'm looking at like the free agency and what's going on with the New York Islanders and I'm just very confused because they got all of these guys who I would think would be Islanders or announcements by now and they're not signed guys like Zach Parise, Kyle Parmeri, Casey Sizika so I don't know if maybe I don't know if they if what's going on there but there are still quite a few players in the free agency market that Seattle can go after uh, even without a trade, you know, guys like uh, if you want to bring in some experience guys like Tyler Bozak, uh, Brandon Dubinsky, Travis Ajak, maybe on defense, you got uh, Jason Demers. Like if they, they, I think that they, you still see some signings, but one other issue that we pointed out with the article that came out when we were talking about the Ford lines is Yanni Gord we still don't know how long Yanni Gord is going to be out. So it's kind of hard to make a signing like a guy like Eric Stahl to, pl- to fill in at that second line center. If you don't know how long Yanni Gord is going to be there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts, Sean? First, I want to ask, is, is Brandon Dubinsky still playing? I know he's been on IR, LTIR, but is he, is he it, trying to come back to another team? I'm not hundred percent sure on that. I don't. I, I have, as far as I know, he was, he's technically still active. I love that. I love Brandon Dubinsky when he was a Ranger and I would love to see him have another kick at the cup. Honestly, 
great heart and soul player, feisty and scored a bit, which is cool. But uh, I think that the trades in terms of the trades, a lot of that was going to be more in the immediate. Like we saw the, um, oh, why is his name escaping me? Tyler Pitlick trade right no, right off the hop. Oh, mm-hmm. I'm staying off the hop. But um, so I think that it's kind of died down now because now now you got guys settling in. We're going to be moving either myself or my family to Seattle. You got – at this point, it just – it doesn't seem needless, but I think that he wants – he's just kind of adding little marginal pieces like the Austin trade uh, – excuse me, signing. Um, Bibo I – I can never pronounce it. Bibo – Bebo? Bebo. 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 I can't remember what we were saying last week. <laughs> we had it last week. <laughs> yeah, the B- I made you say the name last week. <laughs> the Bebo signing, stuff like that, just to plug in holes. I think if he was going to make a trade, if, I think it's got to be for a big-name guy. He, As you said, they don't really have any names on the back end. They got Giordano, but he's definitely slowing down. And I don't think he's going to be the guy anymore. I think that Vince Dunn, this is his time to step up and really grab hold, take the reins. But they don't really have that big name star player. You know, they got guys who fans are going to love, Yanni Gore, Brandon Tanev. But at least until Maddie Beneers, future captain, I'm still on that train, until he steps in and becomes a regular producer – not going to assume his first year pro or at least first year in the NHL is going to put up point per game, but until he becomes that star, they, they don't have one. And I think that's fine. I think that if they got that star player, then they would have built the team a little differently. But in terms of this off season, I think it's more, you know, dot your I's and cross your T's. They see someone for depth, that AHL depth or, at this point, I think it'd be in terms of forwards, for like 16, 17 forward, probably like, you know, ninth, 10th defenseman, one more goalie, go for it. Two-way contracts, keep it nice and cheap. But generally, I, th- I think I think that's it for Ron Francis for this season, at least the off-season part. I, I don't know if we – do we personally, I don't really consider preseason the off-season anymore, and that might be – kind of self-explanatory because it, mm-hmm. I just realized the change of the off three, but you, <laughs> you know, it's not the season is what I'm saying. And I feel like some people kind of lump those together because there's still stuff moving around. Stuff could change. You got yeah. guys signing, you know, I've, guys will sign a week or two before the season, not go through camp, stuff like that, et cetera. So that's kind of where I was going with that. Jeez, I'm struggling. Well, <laughs> I'm a minus I mean, one. <laughs> you know, last year, what was it? Corey Perry signed on the eve of training camp. With uh, Montreal, that was a pretty good signing. But you know what? If they want a big, big name, there's still one big name out there. Expansion draft history, the real deal, James Neal. There you go, right there. If you uh, want to make a splash, he already knows how expansion works. <laughs> uh, with uh, with uh, Vegas, put an A right on him, and uh, I'm I'm sure you could get him at one of those uh, league minimum Corey Perry deals. I was just gonna say, yeah, for league minimum, definitely. He, he, he made his money. No, I mean, you know, all power to the players, pay the players. But, you know, for Ron Francis, we, we, we would like to see some guys at league minimum. I mean, he's, he's only made $54 million in his career. So, you know, he might be a little bit cash trapped. When I'm, when I'm playing NHL on PlayStation, I'm making 54 sheets easy. So I totally know how that <laughs> feels. Uh, we won't bring up my current bank account uh, balance. <laughs> oh man well yeah it's good this is going to be interesting to see how this plays out if there will be any more trades but yeah you guys bring up the the possibility for free agent signing still with some pretty strong names still available that maybe ron francis could could pull in before the uh the off season ends and the preseason begins or before you know maybe has maybe sign them in preseason like we were just saying so we'll see did you want to say something sean i have a question for you guys i just thought of do you think in terms of locker room chemistry, how how much do you think Gord's going to be around while he's still rehabbing from this injury? Do you think that him coming to the lineup, I mean, on-ice chemistry is going to be natural. It's going to have to be found. But in terms of 
off the ice in the room. Everyone's new. Most people are going to be new to each other. Him coming back midway through the year, maybe not being around as much as he would be if he was playing actively. How do you think that's going to go? I would have to assume he's, he's going to be around the team a lot while he's still recovering. I mean, um, I mean, if I was him, if I was joining a new expansion team and I was coming in as one of the people that a lot of guys in this organization are going to be looking up to, um, I would want to be around that locker room and I'd want to be talking to the youngsters and, you know, meshing and bonding with people who are going to be your future line mates. Uh, Yanni Gord has a lot of skill and I expect he's going to have a huge impact when he finally returns and he gets out on the ice in a crack in uniform. So um, I would hope, and I assume he will be around the team a lot, but obviously it's not going to be uh, the exact same until he hits the ice. But I do hope this team spends a lot of time together in bonds. And we saw how it worked out with, with Vegas. It seemed like they just completely got together that season, a bunch of misfit guys, and they carried their, their team to the Stanley cup final. So it's going to be important for this, this team to have locker room chemistry and on ice chemistry. And so until Gord can get on the ice, he's, he's just going to have to focus on building that locker room chemistry. Well, one thing we also have to remember about the Vegas situation is that they went through a very traumatic event, you know, just before their season started, which brought the team together. It brought the city together. So um, yeah, that was kind of what the, that's kind of what happened with the uh, Vegas situation. But Mm -hmm. if I'm the Kraken right now, Every single game until Yanni Gord is healthy, I am sticking him in the concourse behind a plexiglass barrier and uh, getting making him take photos or sign uh, jerseys. I think that it's, you know what, if that if it wasn't year one, you don't do that. But year one, you know, maybe you uh, you trot him out uh, to the fans a little bit in the stands and give them let them meet one of these uh, players. You know, you could. He, he doesn't necessarily have to uh, be as engaged with the team for the first month or so. So send him on the media tour, you know, have him uh, go on Seattle radio, you know, maybe have him raise the 12th man flag at a Seattle Seahawks game. So that that's your promotional uh, piece right now. And it is, is Yanni Gord. That was nice. That was, I love that idea. That was a fantastic idea. Yeah. And so j- just to finish off this, this little segment here, predicting what could happen the rest of the off season, uh, we got a little bit of excitement in the off season. Uh, just, just the other day with Kotka Niemi receiving an offer sheet from the Carolina hurricanes. And so it kind of made me start thinking the idea and I wanted to discuss it on this show. Could we see the Seattle crack and maybe offer sheet a player? I mean, one of the names a lot of people have been mentioning is Elias Pettersson uh, from rival Vancouver Canucks. And with the excitement that that caught Kanyemi offer sheet brought, I can only imagine what would happen if Seattle went uh, and tried to go after Pettersson. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, guys? Do you guys think maybe the Kraken could make an offer sheet for a player or you think they're going to hold off on this? So I'll go to you first, Adam. Well, I don't think that they're going to do an offer sheet because offer sheets are very rare and there's a reason for it because if you do it, you're basically seen as uh, you're disrespecting another team. The only reason why Carolina went after Kakaniemi was because Montreal went after Sebastian Ajo. And I just want to throw this out there. What are you doing, Carolina? $6 million for a guy who scores, what, five goals? Who's going to play on your fourth line? Go, like... What do you do? Like, and then you're going to have to pay him what over 7 million next season. I don't, I don't understand. You know what you, you try Caroline tried to get petty and they're going to get screwed for it. They already have no cap. So, but as I was saying, you know, it, you're not going to really see the, these type of offer sheets, especially in the NA in um, with these star players, because remember Ron Francis has to build, a relationship with these GMs. Mm-hmm. So for trades in the future, like, you know, if, if Montreal is needing help, I don't think they're going to Carolina anymore for, for trade help. So you've already isolated one team. You've isolated your entire division because you don't really see those trades within the division. So when you do the offer sheet, the GMs are kind of limiting themselves to who they can trade with. So I think that, 
this season, you won't see an offer sheet from Ron Francis just because he's trying to build that repertoire with uh, teams. But maybe uh, next season, depending on if the cap goes up a million or if it stays, then you might see some uh, an offer sheet come down. Do you agree with that, Sean? What are your thoughts? Offer sheet or no offer sheet? <laughs> it's so petty. I love it. <laughs> I love it. The offseason needed this. I have a friend who, like, this is, like, something you'd see on TikTok, but in hockey. This is, like, real world. And it's hilarious, the reason behind it. I, I have a friend who, if I explain this to her in, like, bachelor, bachelorette terms, she would find it hilarious. It's amazing. But I, I definitely think that I agree it's not something that um, Ron Francis would do because of the dis- – you know, it can be seen as disrespectful. And – I was having a conversation with somebody about it because I was thinking whether it's for, you know, any team really looking at an offer sheet for Brady Kachuk, the thought process was would Ron, would Ron Francis really do that as his first year at the helm of a team? And I kind of had to think about that for a second and it, it was a very good point. And I definitely think if the, if the, if the player is right, go for it. And when I mean, right, I mean, this is our guy until he retires. Like if you are certain that this is your guy until he hangs him up, go for it. Will you maybe struggle bringing in pieces to help him that you'll have to deal with down the line, but unless it's someone you're absolutely through the moon certain about probably not. And I, excuse me, excuse me twice. I would concede that it's different. It depends on the player too. I mean, if it's a, you know, not a superstar player, I think there's a bit more give there, you know, not forgiveness per se, but it's different talking about Brady Kachuk and Elias Pettersson. And I can't think of an RFA who's that, low who's lower than them on the totem pole right offhand but i think you catch the vibe now i, I want to toss that to either of you and i know tom hasn't given his thoughts yet so i guess tom tom next do you think it's more subjective or do you think are you kind of like a you know one way or the other kind of guy with this uh whether or not they'll do an offer sheet just the concept of, of doing an offer sheet like do you think it's subjective to the player or do you think that you know, you would, you personally would not do an offer sheet. Uh, I honestly, I don't, I, I agree with what you guys have said. I don't, Adam was mentioning, you gotta, you gotta be on good terms with these general managers. You don't really want to, you don't want to overstep your boundaries in your first year and start pissing people off. Um, so uh, honestly, again, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't expect to see an offer sheet, but if there was one, I think it would be a very entertaining storyline if it was Elias Pettersson from the rival Vancouver Canucks. Um, but again, I, I don't really see a situation where they would actually be able to bring Pettersson in and Vancouver wouldn't match that. So uh, I do think it's unlikely, but I, I, if you were going to and you were going to go after a guy like Pettersson, that is a guy who you could uh really build a franchise around i mean vancouver's probably gonna end up trying to do that if they can find them a deal soon um but yeah it it does it would have to be a very a uh, a player that is going to stay around for a long time hopefully retire with your organization and they're committed to being in your city on your team long term so i i agree with you there do you think that now let's let's come a little full circle let's hypothetically speaking the crack and do offer sheet someone Elias Pettersson. I know they didn't obviously, but let's just say theoretically speaking then, and the, 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 and this happened this off season, do you see them making trades now that they have that star player or even if they got that star player in an offer sheet, do you think that Francis would hold off, still play that long game, keep some assets and move forward from there? That's a great question. That's a, that's a very interesting question. I, I do. I wonder because there are, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it kind of depends, I guess it, it would depend on who it is. If it's someone like Pedersen or even Rasmus Dahlin's a guy who's, who's uh, 
able to be offer sheeted if it's a young guy who's who's got a lot of potential maybe you can move one of those those older guys maybe someone like jordan eberly but Mm -hmm. again i think the 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 chances of this happening are are very low but that that is a great a great question i think that honestly ron francis probably could afford to move one of those guys and we've seen he he really wants us to be a young roster as we clearly saw from his expansion draft selections which were pretty shocking and unexpected to a lot of people so I think if he did offer sheet someone and he got a young a young player with a lot of promise, uh, maybe he could move some of those older guys who are still able to produce and bring in uh, some more younger prospects or some draft picks. What do you think, well, Adam? I'll throw two things. First off, if if you offer sheet Pedersen, you got to go all in because you don't want another Jack Eichel situation. Like you don't want to be or a Connor McDavid situation where you're killing the your star players career by not building around them properly second you know it's funny because the nhl i remember there was like a twitter post or instagram post that said uh less let no soap operas only hockey or something like that and it's like the entire nhl is is a soap opera like it's one of the most dramatic like sports is one of the most dramatic like soap operas out there you know you got (laughs) this montreal Carolina feud going on. You got the stories of Nathan McKinnon screaming at uh, his teammates because they're eating what white pasta, uh, white sauce pasta before games. Like this league is so is so dramatic. I just find it uh, funny how you know people keep bringing up that post that the NHL made about the uh, soap operas, and it's like, have you looked at your league lately? Everything that happens is uh, is is basically reality reality television. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've noticed especially this off season has just been crazy. Uh, well, going back the Jack Eichel thing, he just fired his agent and got a new yeah. agent. Like, yeah, there's, there's just been so much going on this off season, and it's still not even done yet. I mean, Eichel's still pretty much almost certainly going to be moved at some point. You still got Tarasenko rumors going around. Could he be moved somewhere? I don't even think this off season's over. I mean, it, it died down for for for. Sorry, for a few weeks there. And then we get this caught Kanyemi offer sheet and it just fires right back up. So the well, NHL has been great entertainment the past few months. I mm-hmm. don't know if you guys have been paying attention to the Pedersen uh, story, but oh, he he changed his location on uh, or changed his Instagram handle not to say Stockholm and, or to say Sweden, not Vancouver anymore. And Vancouver Twitter just blew up over that. He made comments saying that he wanted to sign in Vancouver, but then he uh, wanted to play for a winning team. Oof. Like it just blew up at like, if you ever want to see, if you're ever bored, just go to Canucks Twitter and something's going on. <laughs> that is absolutely ridiculous. I got to make my way into that. Oh, it, yeah, that'll be my nighttime reading tonight. <laughs> you know, you even have, uh, you even have Elliot Friedman going on podcasts talking about like, how uh, and TV shows talking about how Canucks Twitter is undefeated. So uh, <laughs> it, it's it's definitely uh, Seattle's got some uh, big shoes to fill when it comes to their Twitter uh, if they want to try to knock off the champs in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Just aid to the rivalry. Just keep that rivalry going. Now it's now it's taking it to the fan versus fan even more than it would have been a playoff series, let alone you know first game. That's oh man, it's so interesting now how there's so many different levels to a rivalry because of social media. You got the product on the ice. You got the off season battles, whether it's for free agents. Now we're seeing this offer sheet situation. Now it's social media between the fans too. And um, even team social media accounts are going after each other a bit. Now it's just, it's, it's incredible how, you know, t- you think about when we were kids, you, you woke up, you went downstairs and watched, Dragon Tales played outside for a couple hours, ate dinner, watched a baseball game, and went to bed. And now there's, it's a, it's it's so interesting to see how much things have changed. I feel so. Did you just throw out a Dragon's Tale reference? Wow. <laughs> it was either that or Franklin. I was thinking Caillou, but oh man, <laughs> well, bear in the big blue house all day. Bear in the big blue house. Oh man. But yeah, like uh, yeah, you know who needs a playoff rivalry when you can have a sixty tweet back and forth thread between a Seattle Kraken and a Vancouver Canuck fan. Yeah. It's going to be the Kraken versus Johnny eight, six, two, four, nine, eight, six, three, two. Yeah. <laughs> and it's two followers and 150 tweets. 
And you mentioned the the team social media is getting into it. Carolina was having a lot of fun with with that cock and Yemi offer sheet, putting putting tweets out in French. They posted a uh, a picture of a reverse Uno card. They just had it. They had it going. It's it's very the Predators are another good one for that kind of thing. The Predators just screw themselves over by uh, putting up what like ra- like random banners. <laughs> so they're just uh they 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 can get hit so easily because they just they make too many mistakes. Regular season division champions. Yeah, beautiful. <laughs> At a three win streak. <laughs> All right, let's let's move into our last discussion of the day here. Um, again, not news. It's just going to be us kind of discussing and kind of guessing things out here. So there's still a few things that uh, the Kraken have not revealed yet. And one of them that, I, that I've written down here in our notes is the Kraken still don't have a mascot. And I've been, as someone who loves mascots, uh, I, I've, been, I've been waiting for a while for this and wondering when this is going to come out. And we really haven't heard anything about if this team's going to have a, whether they're going to have an octopus or a pirate or what, who this mascot could be. So I'm wondering if you guys have any guesses. Could you guys guess, uh, or even if the Kraken will have a mascot? I mean, right now the only NHL team without a mascot other than the Kraken is the New York Rangers. Um, could, could the Kraken maybe not go with a mascot? Because we really haven't heard anything about it. And here we are less than a month away from preseason. So what do you guys think? I'll go to you, Sean. Well, I mean, the Rangers may not have a mascot, but we got a pretty kicking goal song. So I'll take it. I'll take it. But um, having grown up a Rangers fan, I don't I don't know. I, I want it to be – I want their, you know, their mascot to be a crack. I'm trying to think of how you would make that happen. How can you make that happen? And I'm not so sure. I, w- I will say that the name has to be fierce. Like You can't have that logo that – you know, intro animation and not have something and have something all like, you know, cute and cuddly. Can't do it. Mm-hmm. I'm all for cute and cuddly, not in this situation. Now, this might just be me being nitpicky. Me, when I like to uh, name stuff, segments or like sections or, you know, a guitar or whatever. Want to hear some alliteration in the name. Got to have like something to crack in or like, Blank Kraken. I don't know. So that's going to definitely make things complicated. I need a thesaurus to eat. I should have had my thesaurus. I would have given you something better than that, but give me some <laughs> alliteration. It's fun. It's catchy. It sticks in your ear. I've got muscle milk right here. Alliterate. Alliteration. Muscle milk. <laughs> you mean you have a generic non-sponsored uh, uh, drink on your desk? My bad. My bad. I don't know what the rules are with that. I was well, in the moment I was feeling I was passionate. Well, you know, there's there's one obvious answer that you do. You, the guy, one of the owners helped produce Pirates of the Caribbean. You go talk to Disney. You get a, a Johnny Depp to come in every night and run around like Jack Sparrow on the ice every night. There you go. Simple. <laughs> I love well, it. Yeah, I'll crack and you have your you have your mascot. <laughs> See what I'm what I'm gonna wonder is like. Are we going to see, you know, in Vegas, the big thing is that the Golden Knight fights the other team's knight. So is it going to be like, you know, you'll see a video of a uh, Kraken arm coming up and they're taking down the ship of the other team or something like that. So there's a lot that you can play about this. You don't really need a mascot, honestly, if you have, because I know they're hiring right now the uh, dance crew. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a big one that they're doing. So if you got a dance crew, you don't necessarily need the mascot. Yeah, it's fun to have one, but also you have to be careful because Detroit already has the octopus. So they already got the tentacles. So what are you going to do? You can't do something similar. You you yeah. should you should be applying to work for them. Like your idea <laughs> this is very are insightful. On- point they need to be listening to this podcast and taking notes you are killing it with these ideas tonight (laughs) i love it i i was the 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 vegas golden knights and i was just thinking back their uh chance the gila monster i found was very underwhelming i i I didn't really enjoy that pick so i'm just hoping i would love if they even if the kraken just went with something crazy like how gritty went with uh 
how Philadelphia went with gritty, just something totally random and wacky that the fans can attach to and just build a whole personality and character around, around mascots. I think that's really how it should be done. I think gritty's kind of paved the way for how mascots should be done uh, going forward, but we'll, we'll see. I really don't know. I haven't heard anything at all about a mascot, which is. Also, if you're going to go old Vegas on you, make sure that you know your divisions because when Vegas released their, their video of like, and their video announcing the season, they forgot to mention that Arizona was no longer part of their division. So if you're going to release those videos and do those cool things, maybe make sure you know which division you're in and what division other people are in before you release all those videos. I don't think Arizona knows what division they're in considering they don't know where they'll be playing after this year. So, yeah. and honestly, at this point, I think to go on what you said about putting Yanni Gord in a behind a plexi, uh, plexiglass, you know, case, I, I think he's the mascot for the start of the year. Honestly, <laughs> I think he'd be, I think he'd be a fun mascot. You saw him at the uh, Stanley cup parade and stuff. He's, he's fun. He likes to, he likes to have a good time. I like it. Yanni Gord for Seattle Kraken mascot. That is, you heard it here. THW, what's cracking? That's our prediction. Oh my God. <laughs> we went off the rails with that one. <laughs> another, another fun one here. I think it was, was it you, Sean? You wrote about potential goal songs or was that? Yeah, that was me. Do you want to, do you want to expand on that? Do, is there any goal songs you would recommend? So in looking back, there were definitely geared more towards a rock type music like there was a couple Foo Fighters songs I think I had a Pearl Jam uh, Nirvana I felt like you, you can't leave Nirvana off the list I think it's got to be something that has a great riff something that's catchy you want it to pick you up and take you right away power you know powerful lyrics I, I like mine off the hop was Monkey Wrench by Foo Fighters I would love to hear you know Pass from Gord to Vince Dunn slides it over. One timer Giordano scores. You just hear that da 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 da. And then or either that or it goes straight into the um the chorus. Cause I'm I'm thinking if you listen to the lyrics, don't want to be your monkey wrench. I don't want it. The song's kind of like you don't want to be controlled by somebody else. And what's the best way to shed control than by scoring a goal? Right. Now I had just a bit bit of a caveat something like win song goal song would be different of course still had a couple ideas off that I, you know game seven overtime what would be better coming on than the chorus of my hero by the foo fighters coming on yanni gord break away in overtime goes top shelf boom i don't know a bit of a bias there in terms of uh my preferred genre of music i guess but definitely goal song i think monkey wrench it's fun that always gets me going. I'll, I'll be walking in the workshop at work and I'll be like, all right, monkey wrench comes on. I'm like hop, skip and jump in my way. It's, it just gets you going. It, it's, if you're down to nothing, 10 minutes left in the third, I'm sorry. I'm rambling. This, I love music. This gets me going. Hit me up on Twitter if you need song racks, but you know, you're down to nothing, 10 minutes in the third and you know, Jared McCann scores, breathes life into the building. Yeah. You're down one. But that the song just gives that kind of energy up. I don't know if you guys are into foo or any of that kind of music. And I mean the Seattle connection too is 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 there for him. So here, what, what, what do you guys think? <laughs> have you got any thoughts? I, I love the I love the analysis. Well, you gotta, go, you, you gotta go you gotta, you gotta go single. Seattle bands. So I think Pearl Jam is kind of like the obvious one that they're gonna throw out there. But you know, go one song that I know like my dad gets pumped up every time he hears it is that uh uh can't hold us by uh macklemore it's mm -hmm. got a pretty energetic feel it's got that kind of uh chorus that you can respond to and that people know so there uh you know you don't have to say you have to go with the rock song you could go more like contemporary uh with the like pop song if you really want to mm -hmm. i like it i also i'm, I'm also hoping the uh the horn is something like a boat or something like a, I think that would be awesome. Or even if you could have, I wonder if they could ever do like fog machines or, you know, just, just make it extremely exciting every time they score, have a great song play and just get everyone into it. So or that... you go with like what Tampa Bay has, you put a giant ship in there and you fire the uh, cannon every time. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess like Columbus. Yeah. But 
yeah, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Sorry, not the Lightning, the Buccaneers. They got that big ship. Time they what get a touchdown, they shoot off a a, a cannonball. Why not? A lot of those going with Brady there too, and uh, with I like that idea of can't hold us. But I'm thinking now. I'm thinking that's like a to me, for lack of a better term, motivational. Like is there between wanting to get like hype up, celebrate, and like you want to you know. You can't hold us. We're going to show you. To me, I'm thinking that's like an intro or even a power play song. You know, maybe, maybe I'm just crazy when it comes to, oh, I could, I could riff about music all day. But I, 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 love, I love that selection. I, I can't. The whole believe. episode dedicated to predicting the goal songs, goal Don't horns. <laughs> we can put some together, <laughs> share them on, on our Twitters. Yeah, oh. it's it's gonna be fun. I wonder when we're gonna hear that. Maybe we'll have to wait till preseason. Maybe it'll be a surprise. Who knows? Would but, you uh, hold it from preseason till the uh, like? Would you hold what you're actually gonna do and just do something generic in the preseason so that way that first home game is really electric and like you're seeing everything for the first time? How would how would you guys go about that? Oh, I would do like a different song every single goal in the preseason. Nice. I would just make the preseason as bland as possible, and then just like smack everybody in the face with the home opener. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> Smack everybody. <laughs> well, remember they're not even playing at home. Yeah, mm. yeah. They're they're, they're on tour because their mm-hmm. stadium's not even built. True, true, true. Good point. Yeah, save the save the good goal horn for Seattle. <laughs> God, <laughs> smack everybody in the face. Oh, that. All right, you know, and so I've, I've got one more, <laughs> one more little prediction here, and then and then we'll wrap things up. So. Uh, I think we might we might have talked about this briefly last last week or the week before, but we'll quickly first goal in uh, Seattle crack in history. We'll say regular season. Who do you guys think it could be? Go to you, Sean. You go first. <laughs> well, I did. We we did discuss this last week, and and I gave a. I think I said it was a three one final score with an empty netter for that. Yeah, he predicted the whole game. Yeah, I, I really, I'm really. The later we get into the show, the more I just start riffing. Like, I don't know. I guess I loosen up. I'm a bit more comfortable on air. You know, I'm still still getting used to that. But I'm usually a, a prefer behind the scenes type stuff. So you're really getting me out of my element here, boys. But I definitely think Giordano is going to score it that first goal. I, um, slap shot from the point. And I think that if it's going to be a forward, I think it would be extremely fun if it was Brandon Tanev. Like this is more from a, I'd say Giordano from a, this is what I think, but from a fan perspective, if I were, you know, I would say Brandon Tanev, that would be a fun first goal. And what a better way to, he's going to become a fan favorite. What a better way to kick that off with Mm -hmm. pot in the first goal, give a little, you know, something dirty in front. He's going to be in the dirty areas and just do a nice wide celly one knee, just fist pump, give, give something good, get the fans going. I love it. What do you think, Adam? Well, I think my op- mine is uh, pretty obvious because I've talked about this guy so much. You know, you can blame uh, Trump- Thomas Drant of The Athletic because <laughs> uh, he all he did for like a month was talk about this guy on the, the van cast in Vancouver. But it's got to be Mason Appleton. Like, I'm just going to go with this. He's going to be their like unsung hero this year. Yeah, it, it's going to be uh, fantastic uh, to watch him score that first goal. Uh, I think he's going, uh, you know, I'm not going to predict what he's going to do because that uh, I just have no idea. I just want the puck to go in the net in the end. I don't care how it gets there as long as it gets there and they call it a good goal. But uh, I think it's going to be Mason Appleton and that building is going to absolutely erupt in. Well, I guess their first home game is not in Seattle, but when they finally do get their first goal in Seattle, that building is going to absolutely erupt. And I also think that they're, it's going to erupt in Vegas because I think that the Seattle contingent is going to be pretty strong for their home opener in Vegas, regardless of if they're going, if tickets are going for like $3,000, people will pay from Seattle to go see their team's first ever game. Mm-hmm. And it's Vegas. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would be, a, it definitely would be a fun trip to go for, for crack and fans to go watch their inaugural game in in Vegas, I think I was I was looking at uh, potentially going down there, but I don't know how 
how things will work out with the COVID situation. I assume it's going to, the tickets are going to be insane. So yeah. I may just have to watch it on TV, but I'm, I'm hoping to get to Seattle sometime this season to, to check it out. Um, for, for my prediction for first goal. Um, oof. This is tough. I, I want to say I would love if it was, I would love if it was Tanev. I think that would, like you were mentioning, Sean, I think that would just be awesome. I think he's already kind of established himself as the front runner to become the number one fan favorite on this team. Um, and I think he's going to be trying super hard to, to get that puck in the net. If he can be first, I'm sure it's crossed his mind a few times now after the, the impression he's made. Um, but another guy that I think could maybe call that first goal, and I would love it, is, is Jaden Schwartz, who I think has been underrated a lot of his career and kind of hasn't been given the attention he, he deserves because he is a pretty stellar player. He can score goals. He can, he can make plays. He, he was a huge piece in that St. Louis Blues run to the Stanley Cup final and or Stanley Cup championship in 2019. Um, and I think this, is, this could be a great fresh start for him in a, in a new atmosphere where he's probably going to have more of a spotlight on him than he ever has in his career. And he's still he's still got a lot left in him. So I think he's a guy who could maybe come into Seattle and just reestablish himself as, as one of those main key pieces on a, on an NHL franchise. So just to riff off what nah, last week, it was off the hop. Now I'm saying riff every other sentence. Great. <laughs> so just to riff off of what we, uh, you, you, you and I were saying about Tanev and becoming fan favorites. I posted the uh my meet the kraken on brandon tanev in a kraken fan page and i'm just going to read a quick couple comments quote from courtney i won't say last names for privacy to me this was the best pick they made solid player we'll get the team revved up and the fans too from jacob quote love the pick if anyone gave sid a hard time they soon got hit by branding quote turbo and quote tanev so already fans are taking a liking to him i think it helped that he played off his uh interesting uh player photo from last season at the uh at the show but uh, you know fans are already taken to him and he plays the kind of game that endears players to me personally and they're gonna love him especially if as you said as ter- you know turbo turbo tan of scores that goal there's that alliteration that's gonna oh, it's gonna be electric it's gonna explode i'm wondering what is uh what his new seattle crack and profile is gonna look like if he's gonna <laughs> He's going to do the eyes again. You would have to assume. Maybe maybe even does them wider this time. Who knows? Different team, different ghost. He sees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We will we'll wrap this up. Do you guys have any final comments? Oh, this was fun. This was a fun episode with you guys. Let me tell you. This was a good one. one. I feel like we're, uh, we're really getting the ball rolling here. Episode one thing, four. One thing I'll throw out there is go watch the Women's Worlds right now. They're absolutely incredible. Uh, right now, it's the semifinals. Or, no, it's quarterfinal. Uh, yeah, I think it's the semifinals right now. I think that's what, yeah. So go watch them. I think uh, it's going to be another Canada-US final in there. So hopefully Canada can finally beat that streak and uh, beat the US uh, to take home the uh, <laughs> Women's uh, World Hockey Championship this year. Hopefully? Ho- did, did he just say Hopefully. I don't know, cause uh, I'm I'm liking you with hockey. I'm I'm liking you with two Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> I'm outnumbered here, but uh, so yeah, definitely check that out. The uh, the timing is a little off for me, just being in work during some of the games. I know I missed the USA game today. I'm pretty sure it was at three, and that was right right after my lunch break. But definitely gonna try and catch the reruns of it or the highlights. Yeah, it's good to have hockey to watch anytime, no matter what level it is i'll watch minor hockey if i have to mm-hmm. uh i'm so excited for nhl to start i just keep counting down the days till it starts and it's creeping up i mean not much longer till we finally see a, a seattle kraken jersey on the ice so there's a lot of exciting things coming up in the next month uh and with that we will we will wrap it up so thank you for tuning into this week's episode of thw what's kraken We hope you enjoyed the show and look forward to next week as we'll be breaking down any Seattle Kraken news and rumors that come up over the next few days. Again, make sure to check out our written work at thehockeywriters.com and follow us on Twitter at at Tom Pepper, at Raggio9124, and at Adam K. Blatt. 
from Tom, Sean, and Adam. This has been THW What's Cracking.